Senator Franken, you have done something rare. You have written an actually funny political memoir. It, the political memoir is maybe the worst genre <laughs> in publishing, and uh, I didn't want to write one of those. So, um, you know, in it I, I, I try to be honest and in a... Um, and uh, I try to answer the question that I get asked the most, uh, probably, which is, is being a United States Senator as much fun as working on Saturday Night Live? <laughs> and the answer, of course, is no, why would it be? And um, I also get asked a lot, how did you make the transition? So I explain that, and I also get asked a lot, What's the Senate like? You know, what's it like, especially for someone who didn't come from politics? And uh, then, of course, right now, we're, I'm being asked all the questions that I'm sure um, people are interested in in terms of what's happening in Washington right now. And um, so... Well, that's a good list. I was gonna, I was gonna start with the transition. The, the arc of the story of your book traces your journey from Saturday Night Live to a lot of other things dealing with comedy and political comedy and then your transition into politics but the question that you threw out here is a question I think a lot of people have I had starting the book why would you do that why would you become a politician well um, you know I always had been political and uh, the the sort of the initial animating issue was uh, civil rights. And my parents and my brother and I would watch um, the news while we ate dinner. On tray, we had dinner on tray tables. And um, it was good. It, my, it wasn't TV dinners. And my mom made a good dinner. And, um, but... Uh, my dad was a Republican. He was a Jacob Javits Republican. There used to be these things called liberal <laughs> Republicans. And my dad was one of them. And during the Civil Rights Movement, uh, when demonstrators would have dogs sicked on them or billy clubs or fire hoses put on them, and we'd see that on Cronkite or Huntley Brinkley, which, you know, we kind of trade back and forth, my dad would point to the TV and go, no Jew can be for that. To me and my brother, no Jew can be for that. And in 64, when Barry Goldwater uh, was the nominee for the Republican Party, uh, he, uh, my dad switched because Goldwater had voted against the Civil Rights Bill. So this was like the basic uh, lesson that my brother and I learned, which is justice, is about justice. And, you know, when LBJ signed the Civil Rights Bill, he turned to a staffer, I think it was Bill Moyers, and said, you know, we've just, Democrats have lost the South for a generation, and he was wrong, it's like forever, and we've lost, <laughs> and so he, We've lost the South forever, but uh, we, gain, we gained my dad. <laughs> and, and, uh, and me, and because uh, I, you know, I love my dad, and so that was, and I love my mom too, but he, he, she was a Democrat already, and I had really was kind of identified with him. And so uh, that was the big deal. So. I, I was always very uh, uh, politically minded and, and public policy minded and issue minded. And uh, doing comedy, when I started doing comedy in high school, uh, I mean, I actually started doing it earlier, but when I was doing it with my partner Tom Davis in high school, it, it, we were doing political satire. And that's what I kind of, that was the focus of what we did. And when I got to SNL, uh, wrote, and I write about this, we wrote a lot of the satire uh, on the show, and, uh, or the, the political sketches, 
And uh, a lot of them I wrote with Jim Downey, who is a, a, a great, hilarious writer, and he is a thoughtful conservative. And we never felt it was a job of the show to have a political point of view, to have a bias. And we wanted to do well-observed uh, satire that uh, didn't punish you for not knowing stuff, but rewarded you for knowing it. So we, we, I, I was very proud of the stuff I did over the years. So I was always interested in that. And uh, when I finally left Saturday Night Live, um, I wrote a book called Rush Limbaugh's Big Fat Idiot and Other Observations. And boom, uh, people uh, were um, coming up to me and saying, thank you, <laughs> thank you for doing this. And, um, you know, I kept doing that, and I got, uh, did, did my radio show, and what really motivated me to run for the Senate, and I write about this in the book, is Paul Wellstone. And Paul was... Um, Uh, Minnesota senator, uh, amazingly passionate guy who really believed strongly in justice and in, um, you know, mental health was a, a huge issue of his that is part of his legacy that I fight, uh, fight for. But he fought for veterans, homeless veterans. He fought for poor people. He did this while he was a professor at Carleton College. He won in 1990 in a campaign that was an amazing campaign. He was, a, he was an, um, an organizer. And he was, he was the guy I did the most fundraising for and the mo most stuff as a senator for. He died 11 days uh, before the election in 2002, about a week or no, a week or two before that, I guess about three weeks before that, he had voted against going to war in Iraq. And he was one of the very few uh, incumbents who did that. And um, uh, so it was a, just tragic when he died. I'd been campaigning for him. Uh, and then Norm Coleman won that race. And a couple months after he was in office, uh, Roll Call did an interview with him, a profile of him, and it had him in his office uh, chewing on an, uh, you know, and gesticulating with an unlit cigar, which I don't know why people would do that, but um, <laughs> he uh, just was full of himself. And at one point he said, to be blunt, I'm a 99% improvement over Paul Wellstone. And I read that, and I just went, who's going to beat this guy? And um, I didn't quite say that. <laughs> but... Um, and that was the first moment ever I had ever considered running for office. And frankly, I didn't right away think that I was that guy. But the more and more, uh, as time, that was like, again, t uh, early 2003. And the, you know, the, it, it, Franny and I moved back to Minnesota and just to explore it. And as I, the more I explored it, the more I felt like I enjoyed, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed going around to bean feeds and all the DFL stuff. And, uh, it, it, uh, and, I, and I took it on. You write about how the closer you got to declaring your candidacy and when you finally did declare your candidacy, the more you got the advice, stop being funny. And you had a hard time with this. Right. What, <laughs> <laughs> I, what, the, the, what, made it, what made you stop? Because you did eventually rein it in. Well, the, the, you know, the first, For a while. Well, yeah, until now, basically. <laughs> um, 
Basically, what ha- I, I remember, I you know moved back to Minnesota, but even before I moved back, I started talking to Jeff Blodgett, who had been Paul's campaign manager in all three of his Senate campaigns. And I remember sitting down with him, having coffee with him. And politics in Minnesota especially is a lot about coffee. I imagine it is here too. And, um, and thanks to you guys, the coffee got better. Uh, it used to be weak Lutheran church coffee is, is the, the worst coffee in the world. Uh, so, I remember having coffee with Jeff and he said, you know, just as an exercise, why don't you write a five-minute speech without a joke? And I thought to myself, why would anyone do that? <laughs> I go, why would you want to do that? And every, everything I'd ever communicated politically had been through humor, uh, and so I, I, or kind of through humor and, and through other stuff, but mainly humor. And so, uh, and then when I finally did uh, announce, uh, right away, everything, they put the Coleman campaign, the Republicans started putting everything I'd ever written or said in comedy through this $15 million machine called the Dehumorizer. And uh, it, was, it was built with this very, very sophisticated uh, Israeli technology that, <laughs> Uh, could just take the humor out of anything and rob it of its context. If you write, if you write satire, you're using things like irony and hyperbole and um, ambiguity even. And man, oh man, robbed of those things, things can look pretty ugly. And uh, so it was just a nightmare. Um, and I, I kind of had, I had thought that being funny would be an advantage <laughs> and, <laughs> and, or it'd be good, you know, and uh, I just had to, like, at a certain point, give up on it. Um, you know, I, I, I'll give you an example of a dehumorizer and how extreme it could be. Uh, I had written an article once about, it doesn't matter what it was about, except it was sort of about technology and me and uh, improvements. Anyway, so I just said, and I, I said, the Internet is just a great learning tool uh, for kids. I said, for example, my son last year did a great sixth grade report on bestiality for his class. <laughs> and. He, he downloaded a lot of great visual aids. <laughs> and the kids in the class just loved them because, you know, at that age, they're just sponges. <laughs> so the, the point of that joke is, hey, maybe you should look at what your kids are looking at. It was kind of a conservative joke. It was like monitor, maybe monitor your kids' downloads. And so anyway, so... They may turn that into an ad which was like, Hello, Franken. <laughs> Jokes about bestiality. And it came from infinity, <laughs> you know, th- through your eyeballs, out the back of your brain. And my mother in law cried <laughs> when. <laughs> And, and she didn't cry because I joked about BCL. She cried at, what are they doing to my son-in-law? And so it just became, I had to really, uh, and then we, we also did, um, we did focus groups early on, and we learned that, man, people in Minnesota, at least then, uh, just uh, didn't think being, a comedian and, you know, having award-winning Emmy, five Emmys and all this shit, that didn't mean, that didn't mean you were smart. And, uh, but they were impressed that I had written books. <laughs> <laughs> we found this out in the, in the focus group, and, I, and, and we found that what really, and this was so counterintuitive to me, 
I, I went to Harvard. I went to, um, I went to Harvard. And so, <laughs> and I had always thought, just don't mention that, you know? Don't mention you went to Harvard. And, and but the, in the focus groups, they went, oh, he's smart. You know, he must be really smart. So it be, uh, so it was play down the comedy. <laughs> Books are okay. And Harvard's just great. And uh, so, <laughs> and, um, does it, I wondered, in the context of this, does it piss you off that there's this other guy out there that really didn't run from his TV persona, and all he had to do is say, he, I'm like a smart guy, and... Or, no, or I am a smart guy. Or I'm I am really a smart guy. Smart. And he just played his TV persona <laughs> straight into the presidency where you had to spend six years... Well, I write about this. I write about sort of the irony of my race in 2008, and because I had written about bestiality, uh, I was guilty of moral turpitude. But I didn't say I engaged in it, I didn't say that, that I grabbed animals by the crotch, you know? <laughs> I, like, I, I didn't brag about that. <laughs> and so the irony of, of uh, yeah, I talk a lot about the irony of the, uh, my 2008 and his 2016 runs in, in those respects. And, but I, I also talk about Trump in regard to where we are now as compared to where we were uh, in 2005. And 2005, after this very close election, um, you know, Bush said uh, he had capital, and Rove talked about a permanent majority for Republicans, and we were organizing and Air, because of Air America and Media Matters, which was pushing back on the right-wing media and and the Center for American Progress and other, we. We stopped them on social security uh, privatization, and you know it, it, there are other. <laughs> and now we have to mobilize against this health care. Um, the, the bill passed in the <laughs> in the House, according to somebody who's very. Um, you know, very insightful about health care, is mean. <laughs> this is the only guy in the country who had figured out that health care policy was complicated. No one would have thought. No one thought that. Man, oh man, it is... Um, Let's go back to a, a simpler time. <laughs> For a moment. Yeah, yeah. So you're getting everything you've said in the past is getting put through the dehumorizer. Yep. You're on the campaign trail. You're trying to spin yourself away from your comedic per persona, but it's not easy. You've got a lifetime of instinct. Plus, you think comedy is a good tool for speaking truth to power, for connecting with people. Right. And you go out, uh, just in one of many great examples of this you, you bring up in the book, uh, you go to a town or city to make a speech, and there's a giant German statue. Oh, Her Herman the German. Um, New Ulm, Minnesota is this beautiful town in south-central Minnesota, and it's New Ulm. It was uh, founded by Germans, and um, they have a statue to Arminius, who was a Hun uh, who... Uh, butchered a lot of Romans um, in 9 AD um, in a battle, and uh, it was when Christ was just a tot. You know, it's like a, it was just a little guy. And um, so in New Ulm, they have this statue to Arminius, and it's a tall statue on a 20 feet tall or 25, and it's on a 75-foot pedestal. 
and uh, it's in this park. It's quite impressive, and it's called Herman the German. I call him Herman the German. So I'm in New Ulm, and I'm, we're, I'm in the park doing uh, a bean feed. Actually, it's they have a uh, we have a group of Democrats, and there's a tracker there. Now I'm I grew up in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. St. Louis Park is a suburb of Minneapolis. It's the Jewish suburb of Minneapolis. And by that I mean it's about 25, at, when I grew up, about 25% Jews. And that's a lot of Jews in Minnesota. That's, <laughs> that's a shtetl. That is, that's a lot of Jews. So, um, and Tom Friedman is from there, and the Cone brothers are from there, and Norm Ornstein's from there, and I'm from there. So anyway, but it's called St. Jewish Park in, in uh, Minnesota. And so I'm, I'm a self-respecting comedian, and I'm in the shadow of Herman the German. And of course, I immediately think to myself, you know, I grew up in St. Louis Park, and we, we, we had a statue too, called Stu the Jew. <laughs> and, <laughs> but I didn't say it. <laughs> I didn't say it because I know they would have turned that into, uh, you know, Al Franken blames the people of New Ulm for the Holocaust. <laughs> so I, w I had exercised a little discipline and didn't do it. And then, like, about a month later, New York Magazine uh, comes to do, like, a profile of me. And at one point, we sit down for an interview, and they go, like, so has there ever been a joke that you thought of that you didn't tell? And I go, oh, yeah, Stu the Jew. <laughs> <laughs> and my staff goes, like, why did you do that? <laughs> and that's when, I, that's when I learned something, which is the pivot. I learned to pivot sometimes you because I had always been taught as a kid from my parents and teachers you know if someone asks you a question answer it and give them a nice complete answer and and it, with the press that's the dumbest thing to do <laughs> with the press you're supposed to pivot to what you want to you know the message you want to send that day so you know a pivot is like Norm Coleman's ahead of you by 15 points in the polls. How are you going to convince DFLers, Democratic Farmer Labor Party, uh, DFLers of Minnesota that you're the guy to take them on? And, you know, I would at first would answer that question, but then the pivot is, you know, as I travel around Minnesotan, Minnesota, Minnesotans don't care about polls. What they care about is their kids' education. <laughs> What they care about is making sure that they get a world-class health care and that everyone is covered even if they have pre-existing conditions. And then yeah, that's a pivot. That's what you're supposed to do if you're a competent politician. <laughs> and, and it took me like a whole, it took me a long time to learn that. And right after the Stu the Jew thing was, that was it. I went like, why did I do that? That was stupid. And then so I got another training in pivoting. And, and then I did my next interview with like a guy who'd interviewed me before for one of the uh, Star Tribune, I think. And so I'm gonna go, okay, I'm gonna pivot, I'm gonna pivot, I'm gonna pivot. So he asked me a question and I pivoted. And then, and it just, he didn't seem to blink at all. And then he asked me another one and I pivot even like a more egregious pivot. And then, <laughs> and nothing, you know, he's fine with that. And then, now I'm going like, this is fun. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> and he's like, so I'm like wildly pivoting, like just for the s sake of seeing how much I can pivot. And at the end of the interview, you know, like a 20 minute interview, he turns to my press secretary and goes, you know, I, he's getting good. I think he's gonna. <laughs> I got me. He, I think he's got a shot. <laughs> so you pivot yeah. all the way to the Democratic nomination uh, yeah. 
when you're in your Senate run. But there is a point where Republicans, in digging up uh, your old jokes and trying to make use of them, find one that you end up having to apologize for yep. against your own instincts. Well, yeah. At, I, at I, first. No, it was against... Here, here's... I'll, you know, I'll tell what this is. Um, at SNL, we would do rewrites late on Thursday night. And um, it would go to 3 in the morning or something. And it would get pretty dark and raunchy, right? And so, in fact, Christine Zander, I write this in the book, a writer who wrote on the show for seven years, great, hilarious writer, you know, she, would, she had a thing when someone would say something raunchy or something, she'd just go, dear lawsuit diary. <laughs> and, and it just got, you know, and a lot of what you write at that time, you're getting punchy and you're just right. But you're right, you're working. This is work. This is the work that comedy writers do. And there is such a thing, there is an actual phenomenon about late night rewrites. So anyway, Norm MacDonald had this take on Andy Rooney. And it was a similar take that most comedians had on Andy Rooney, which was, and he was amazingly popular and 60 Minutes humorist, and, but that the take that most younger com comedians had was that he, he, it, his stuff was just banal and irritatingly so. So, uh, and, and Norm did Andy Rooney, and he, we, we were rewriting the Andy Rooney sketch that he had done, and he had a great first part of it, and it was about, it was just, I cleaned out my desk this week, <laughs> and, I, you know, there are a whole bunch of old letters. Here's one from California. This one's from Illinois. Here's another one from California. <laughs> this one's from Michigan. Here's another one from California. <laughs> this one's from California, too. I guess a lot of people live in California. <laughs> and so that was... <laughs> and so we kind of had that germ of it, which is nailing Andy Rooney for... So I go, like, why don't we just turn him into a monster. <laughs> and so, like, you know, here's a vial, oh, here's an empty pill vial of quaaludes. <laughs> I slipped some of these into Leslie Stahl's coffee and, <laughs> and raped her. Okay, not a joke for the air, it was for the table. There was a New York magazine writer who was there that week, and he, ca and he captures this and it's safe. Now, they, you, this is like, I didn't intend that to be on the air. Uh, Michael Gerson, who I think is a great conservative columnist, writes a collection of stuff of the thing, and he said, I wanted to base a <laughs> sketch on raping Leslie Stahl, you know. So this really caused a crisis, as you can imagine. And I remember talking to Conan O'Brien during this period, and he said, like, if I was on trial and a prosecutor came up to me and said, Mr. O'Brien, during, have you ever, during a 3 a.m. rewrite session, made a joke about defiling Lincoln's body immediately after he had been assassinated. <laughs> I would have to throw myself on the mercy of the court. <laughs> so, I'm trying to... Ex we get in this thing where I'm bleeding delegates because of this, and there's a convention, there's a... We, we, really normally bestow the, you, the there are there is a primary but but before that there's a convention where you get the DFL endorsement 
And I had been way ahead, and now we're bleeding these delegates. And um, so this was a real crisis. And um, I was, I, I write about, about sort of a, I, I didn't have a, the way things were going, things happened so fast, I didn't really have time for a dark night of the soul. But I had like a dark hour of the soul. <laughs> And I was thinking, like, maybe I shouldn't have done this. Maybe, uh, you know, I can... And everyone's saying you should apologize for it. And I'm going, like, I don't want to... I was doing my job. I was... And what happened was we changed it to... He put it in Mike Wallace's <laughs> coffee and took photographs of him uh, nude or something. That was, that was how it ended up. But I'm trying to, and we get to the convention and I'm making this speech to a big crowd of delegates, and this is it. This is sort of it. Everything hung in the balance here. And I had wanted to apologize, but in a way that wasn't selling out, that wasn't dishonest, you know? So I basically, and I got it, I finally found it, and I just said, you know, this is why I'm running, to get health care to every Minnesotan, uh, get our kids a good education, make sure that we have good jobs. But that's not what this camp this week has been about, and I'm sorry for that. And I really was sincerely sorry for that. When I said, I'm sorry for that, the whole place just went, oh, thank God. <laughs> they wanted me to apologize, and I wanted to apologize, but I wanted to do it, because my campaign manager, Stephanie Shriak, who had just come in, she'd just stepped into the campaign, um, said, how do you feel about this? And I said, I'm sorry. You know, and so it was, and after that she said, I never had a base problem after that. I never had a problem. We had all the volunteers we wanted. Because, and, and that when I said, they, they all, and then I got a standing ovation. And it was basically, we got, they knew I wanted to do it. They knew I wanted this. And they got the guy they wanted. So that was a moment. And, I'm trying to explain, sort of, you know, the most important cubic foot of a campaign is inside the candidate's skull. And um, I kind of try to explain what I was going through in this really weird, unique situation from having been a comedy writer. And I actually started that whole thing out by uh, the guy who was probably my biggest challenger, Mike Cerisi, who was this uh, wildly successful trial lawyer, he, he dropped out one day, and right before he dropped out, I saw that Elliot Spitzer had been nailed for, you know, going to a, a prostitute. And I remember just thinking, like, why the hell would he do that? Doesn't he realize all the people that are working for him, that have worked to get him where he is? And that's how I felt. And, um, and then this cheer goes up in our office, and Cerisi had dropped out. And everyone's just going nuts, and I'm going like, yeah, that's great. Why did Elliot Spitzer do that? And so the reason I start with that is that I had that moment of like, have I, and, and you don't know how much Paul Wellstone's memory hung over this race. And so I felt like I was letting Paul down. I felt like maybe I shouldn't have done this and maybe, and, but I sucked it up because I asked Al Gore, I emailed Al Gore, I said, uh, I, I don't know if you know this, but I think sometimes you're unfairly criticized in a campaign. <laughs> and. Uh, what advice do you have for me? And he just wrote back, suck it up. So we're turning past many pages in the book here, but you ultimately 
win this race. It's yes. a, a big fight, a recount, the closest race in Senate history, is that By right? percentage basis, yeah. Um, 312 votes out of 2.9 million. <laughs> I know. You know, um, <laughs> I write in the book, Maria Cantwell, I came out here and did a fundraiser for her, I can't remember this, a few, couple years ago, four years, whatever it was, and um, we're just sitting at you know, some rich person's house, and afterwards, <laughs> afterwards, we're, it's in the San Juan Islands, you know, it's a beautiful, gorgeous thing, and we're just kind of relaxing afterwards, and she started talking about her recount, and she went, oh, God, it was awful. Oh, it was two weeks. <laughs> she goes, how long was yours again? And I went, eight months. <laughs> and she goes, oh my God. I went, you know, it wasn't the Bataan death march. I mean, you know, at a, a certain point in that eight months, it was kind of my new normal. I'm in a re I'm in a, and I won the recount like after two months and the rest of the six months was just uh, litigation. And, um, and, uh, you know, Coleman was ahead the morning after, and he said if he were me, he would uh, take a step back and let the healing begin. <laughs> <laughs> and then I won the recount, and he, he just adopted the anti-healing position. <laughs> and, and, and stuck with it for as long as possible. So you land in the Senate, and you still feel that you need to hold your comedian persona close. You need to prove to Minnesotans that you're yeah, there. Yeah, especially now. I won with such a close margin, and I just wanted to prove to the people of Minnesota that I was there for a serious, serious reason. So I just, I'm not going to be funny. I'm just not funny. Did you find anyone in the U.S. Senate, any senators who you could actually share a joke with? Is oh, anyone God, yeah. No, no, no. I mean, no, I meant publicly funny. Um, right. Uh, actually, uh, sense of humor in the Senate is a good thing. And collegiality is a good thing. You can't, it's, it's impossible to get anything done unless your word is good, first of all. But then you just develop friendships and, you know, the, the Republicans were a little wary of me because I had used so much of my comedy to heap scorn and ridicule on Republicans. <laughs> but like, man, right away they figured it out. Like the first day I got sworn in um, and uh, um, Jim DeMint, uh, then South Carolina Senator, incredibly conservative, comes up to me and says, how are things on the far left? And I said, they're great. How are things on the nutcase right? <laughs> and he thought that was hilarious. And, <laughs> and so, and then, you know, and uh, a lot of my colleagues have great senses of humor. You have uh, a story like this about Jeff Sessions. No. Before, before the, before uh, the recent. Jeff, la you know, uh, that's a long story, but... Uh, Jeff's wife, uh, Mary, knit a baby blanket for, for my first grandchild. So it's hard to hate a guy whose wife did that, and you don't want to unfairly demonize a guy whose wife knit the, the blankie for your <laughs> grandson. So it was good that I've been able to fairly demonize him. <laughs> but anyway, so... But, you know, they're funny. I mean, um, Lindsey Graham is hilarious. I, when he was, when he was uh, like 16th out of 17 in the last uh, presidential race, I went up to him and I said, Lindsey, if I were voting in the Republican primaries, I'd vote for you. And he said, that's my problem. <laughs> um, so... So most of my, you know, most of my colleagues have a good, have a sense of humor, and some even have a good sense of humor, and, but there was one, Tom Coburn, who, you know, most people who, who 
can't sing, they can't sing on key, will say, I, I, have, I have a t- bad ear, I can't sing. No one will admit not having a sense of humor, except Tom Coburn. Tom will admit it. And uh, he would say, like, in, uh, you know, I'd make a joke in, like, a, a, a markup or something in a business meeting, and everyone would laugh, and he'd go, I don't get Al's jokes. <laughs> and he was, so, so anyway, so after enough of this, I went to him, uh, and I said to him, Tom, can I take you to breakfast? Because we hadn't been uh, connecting at all. Everything was a misfire. So he said, uh, or can I take you to lunch, I said. And he said, take me to breakfast. I said, okay. So we, we go to breakfast in the Senate uh, dining room, and it's 8 in the morning, and we're sitting down, and I said, look, for the next 40, 45 minutes, however long this is, let's just have fun, okay? He goes, sure, okay, fun. And, <laughs> and I said, uh, let's talk, you know, we can talk about politics, we can talk about, um, you know, our families, our careers, whatever. And he goes, but let's have fun. He goes, okay, fun. And I said, okay, now, now he was known as Dr. No, in the Senate because he would put holds on a lot of stuff. He was a big Federalist. He didn't believe the role of the federal government was to do pretty much anything. And he was, a, he was called Dr. No because he had been an obstetrician gynecologist during his career. So, okay, so he said, fun. So I said, okay, let's talk a career. Let's talk about our previous careers. Let me ask you something. To be a doctor in Oklahoma, do you have to have any formal education? <laughs> and he, he says, yes, you've got to go to medical school. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I said, okay, uh, Tom, that was a joke. And that's what I used to do for my career. I used to do jokes. So he calmed down, and then uh, for the next 40 minutes or so, I taught him what a joke was, uh, what the proper reaction to a joke was. And at the end, later that day, we got a note from him, which was, I really had fun. And, so that was, that was that. So then, you know, I, made, uh, I uh, observed the protocols of the Senate, and when I had any story that involved a private conversation, uh, I, with, I have an exception on this, which is Cruz, Ted Cruz, but I contacted my colleagues, and I just got permission to tell the story. So I call... Uh, uh, Tom, he's retired in Oklahoma, and I call him up. I go, well, Tom, you remember that breakfast we had? Remember, you know, the joke? Uh, uh, I go, like, is it okay if I tell that in my, my book? And he goes, like, we have a First Amendment. You can say whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, I'm just trying to be collegial and he, well, you're a gentleman, but you say whatever you want. <laughs> and so I did. And All right, people are going to want to ask you questions. Yeah. If you've got questions for Senator Franken, start thinking about them. Start condensing them also, please. Um, but I do want to talk about Ted Cruz since sure. you brought him up. You have come to have a certain feeling for him. Well, as I say in the book, I say that uh, what you should know about Ted Cruz is that I probably like Ted Cruz more than most of my colleagues like Ted Cruz, and I hate Ted Cruz. <laughs> and and. Uh, I like him more than most other uh, colleagues like him because he actually has a sense of humor. Not a good one, but he has one. And he values comedy, or at least he says he does. So, I mean, 
it, it's, you never know with this guy, but uh, I write a chapter in which I explain why uh, he, people don't like him in the Senate. And in, in the Senate, you really have to, one, your word has to be good. And two, you really have to be collegial and not, um, uh, you know, not be a toxic co-worker, which he kind of is. He's a guy in the office who microwaves fish, you know. <laughs> he, that's, he just... And he doesn't, and, and to get anything done in the Senate, you've got to have some decent relationships with somebody. And, if some, and he has not really done, accomplished anything other than really uh, getting the government shut, shut down once. I brought up Jeff Sessions a moment ago because you do have a light moment with him in the book. Yes. But more recently, and thankfully, you got him to perjure himself, some would say. Uh, and you've well. had moments. You've had moments like this with Neil Gorsuch, Betsy DeVos. Your question. Well, I have. I mean, I didn't get Gorsuch to perjure. No, no, so, no. But, but you have had uh, moments or, that reached reached us because your question somehow penetrated the clutter more than others. Oh. I'm. Now, obviously, when I was writing this book, I didn't anticipate Trump winning, and I didn't anticipate these hearings, but I wrote about hearings, because I'm good at hearings. And uh, I was particularly good at, uh, you know, you get the testimony the night before, usually. And I would like to read the testimony, because these, this is important stuff. These hearings are important things, and it's important issues that affect the people of Minnesota and affect the people of Washington State and affect the people of the country. And these, you know, when you're testifying before the United States Senate, I think you should, one, be truthful. And um, I just had this kind of thing where I would read the Republicans' testimony first. And because of my training from lies and lying liars who tell them a fair and balanced look at the right, and uh, Rush Limbaugh is a big fat idiot, and The Truth with Jokes, all these books I had written, I really am good at spotting when they're lying. Can I translate bullshit? Because in the audio book, you say that senators can't say something like that, so I just wanted to... Yeah, you wanted fold to... the roll. Right. <laughs> I have a little thing that says USS after words like folds are all. Because just in the United States Senate, you can't say what you said. <laughs> so, but no, I mean, and, and I'm really, I'm kind of good at, and also because I'm a comedian and a performer, I was a performer too, um, I'm good at um, framing things in a way for a, a, a maximum effect, I think. So with Betsy DeVos, it was simply that I had a, oh my goodness, I had a, um, I had been told, you have a courtesy visit with these nominees in your office, and I had been told before my visit by colleagues that, uh, in, on the HELP Committee and uh, Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, she doesn't know much about, <laughs> about education. So I have her come, and I just want to, you know, just f feel out how little she knew. So I, basically what happened was I, after two or three questions, my, me and my education staff were going like, oh my goodness, oh man, she does not know anything about public education. She just doesn't. She's been this, she's uh, done this uh, voucher stuff, really, and she's said it, and her husband has said it, this, to build God's kingdom, to get, you know, public school money to, to pay for kids to go to parochial school. And 
that's and and she, and her family, the DeVos family, has given about two. Uh, actually, Bernie asked her this in the help committee. He just went, uh, "How much money have <laughs> has your family given to the Republican Party?" <laughs> and she uh, and she, she just goes, oh, "About two hundred million," <laughs> and and. And you go, well, let me ask you something. Do you believe that you would be here if your family hadn't given $200 million to the Republican Party? She goes, oh, no, yeah, I think I would be. <laughs> okay, so then I just asked her, and I thought a lot about this, um, in education, and No Child Left Behind was all about testing and all about trying to hold schools accountable. And uh, the first No Child Left Behind, the first rules, the rules were that you had to test only in grade level. So um, if you were a sixth grade teacher, and there were or, say, and there were tests in that, or eighth grade, you, the kids would be tested just at that level, and you would be, you and the school would be judged on what percentage of kids exceeded proficiency. And so it created this perverse race to the middle, which is that teachers would focus on just the kids above and below, just above and below proficiency. And the kid up here, there's no, nothing you could do to that kid that they would fall below proficiency. And the kid down here, that year, you probably couldn't get that kid the proficiency. So the focus kept being on these kids right in the middle. Well, in Minnesota, they felt that was silly. And also, the No Child Left Behind tests were given in, like, uh, late April. And you didn't get the results until the end of June or in July when it was too late for the teachers to use the test results to inform their instruction. So in Minnesota, we started, in addition to the No Child Left Behind test, taking these uh, computer adaptive tests. And they were computer tests so that you get the results right away. And they were adaptive, meaning that you could test out of grade level. So if the kids were getting questions, everything, you know, were getting stuff wrong, the questions would get easier and you could determine what grade level they're at if they're below proficiency. And if the kids were getting everything right, the question again, you'd see where that kid is. So, uh, and, and the whole thing about this is, is that a fifth grade teacher who takes a kid from a second grade level of reading to a fourth grade level of reading is a hero and not a goat. But under growth, uh, and that's why you measure growth instead of proficiency. And this is sort of the key <laughs> to the debate in how you hold schools accountable. And of course, if you're going to be giving money from the public school system to private schools and Catholic schools and so forth, you really want to make sure that that's actually doing some good, and, and, and by the way, it hasn't. And so I basically said two-thirds of what I just said before asking her, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the controversy or the argument of growth versus proficiency. Um, I mean, I'm mixing metaphors, deer in a headlight, accompanied by tumbleweeds. <laughs> it was stunning. And it went viral, and every teacher, and, and not just teachers, but parents, and, and principals, and superintendents, and 
anybody involved in education in any way at all, you know, was going, thank you. And she... I want to... I want to let people know if you have questions and you're wanting to ask one, now's the time to line up at the microphones here. Um, and while you're doing that, we'll be quick with questions, and I want to ask you one last question, particularly here in Seattle. People spend a lot of time feeling bad about the state of our politics, feeling scared about where the country is going and worrying about what is going on in Congress. You're there. How bad is it, really? Well, you're not alone, believe me. Um, you know, I, uh, this is national, and um, we, uh, Trump, every day to me is an affront um, that this guy is president. Um, <laughs> And I write about sort of my, you know, I wrote these books about lying. And it seems that you don't pay a price now for lying at all. Sh you know, just shamelessly lying, repeatedly lying, <laughs> lying for the sake of lying. And it almost as if you're rewarded for it, as if his... Um, I don't know, his supporters feel like it's just more interesting if you lie. You know, it's like a movie loosely based on a real story. <laughs> if you enhance it, uh, I'd, I'd rather see the, you know, a movie that takes a lot of liberties. And, um, you know, I, I don't know where this is all going to lead, um, but he, you know, I just put it this way, uh, in terms of the Russian investigation uh, and whether they had any ties to it, uh, to the, the interference. The Trump people and Trump himself aren't acting like people who have nothing to hide. And so, in the meanwhile, in the meantime, we have terrible stuff happening, whether it's about dropping out of Paris, and the, the, the biggest crisis to me is healthcare. And what's happening, And what's happening right now, and what's happening right now in the Senate. And uh, so that's where my focus is. Uh, I do, I'm on Judiciary Committee. I have some oversight um, on, on this investigation, but I am just scared to death about uh, any version of the House bill passing. So. All right, let's start. Let's start over here. Sorry, excuse me, I have a couple questions. My name's Allison, I'm with, uh, I'm with Town Hall, house, house manager. I have a couple announcements, not questions. First, um, after, after the Q&A is finished, there will be a signing line downstairs. If you want to get your book signed, I would exit out th that way, back behind you to your left, the south stairs. If you wanna just exit, um, please exit the north stairs. Um, just so you know, during the signing line, there's no personalization and no posed photos. It's just because we have, uh, we got to get yeah, uh, through, get through it. it. And I saw, okay. just go to the uh, title page. I think you guys will yep, handle that. Will and then I'll that. sign it and I'll try to look at you. <laughs> <laughs> well, at some point. Yes. <laughs> and I we, may say, enjoy. or. Yes. And we only have a, a time for just a handful of questions, a couple questions. So if you don't get your question answered, I apologize. But thank you. Okay. Let's start here. So this question is about health care. With people moving more and more in a progressive way and people just dying for single payer in our country, 
when and how are the Democrats going to start sticking their necks out and supporting the single payer <laughs> bill? Okay. And I know it's about money. I know it's about corporate support. But let, if you have something beyond that to share, I'd love that to hear that. Well, I certainly would support single payer and support single payer. I write in the book that in 2009, when we passed the Affordable Care Act, we needed 60 votes for anything. And those of us who were for single payer were about 50 votes short. <laughs> so what we did with the Affordable Care Act, during, oh God, I don't want to give too long answers to these things. During, when we were doing the affordable, uh, during, in my debates with Norm Coleman, he would say, we have the best healthcare system in the world because of Mayo, because you get, because Minnesota, we have Mayo, and that's the best health. And the thing is, is that Mayo isn't, is great. You get great care at Mayo and the Cleveland Clinic and some other places, but that isn't a healthcare system. We, we didn't have a system. We had a lot of different systems. If you were in Medicare, you were in the Canadian system. You were in single payer. If you're in the VA, if you're in the military, or uh, you're getting it through the British system, socialized medicine. If you were getting it through your employer, you're in the German system. If you didn't have insurance, you were in the Cambodian system. <laughs> and what we're trying to do we couldn't get single payer, we couldn't get it done. So what we're trying to do is get people from the Cam Cambodian system into one of the other systems. And that's what we tried to do. And there were a lot of good things that came out of the ACA and a lot of progress. And what we should be doing right now is addressing the weaknesses in it. And, and part of it are weaknesses that are that came about because of deliberate sabotage by Republicans. And, but I'll, I gotta move on to the next okay, question. I'd like to I could talk a lot about our health care. Yeah. Uh, Senator Franken, thank you for all you do and thank you for being here tonight. Um, I'm wondering, as a member of the Judiciary Committee, what you and your colleagues are doing or planning to do in order to maintain the independence of the judiciary now that the filibuster has been effectively removed from most nominees. Well, um, of course, we had already removed it for, for district courts and circuit courts, and that was us in 13, but that was because we could not get them to do equivalent of the Gang of 14, which w w happened in 2005. Um, so they did it on the Supreme Court. Um, they are really, uh, we had, uh, I chaired because uh, Diane Feinstein had to do something. So I chaired uh, a hearing where we had two unbelievably awful nominees, uh, both of whom had for some reason done blogs that, you know, one called um, uh, Justice Kennedy a prostitute. That's like, how, you want to be a federal judge and you do that on a block? I can't believe this. So we were, uh, you know, I mean, they, he won the election. Trump won the election. They get to nominate. And they have the majority and they're going to... And so right now, this is it's the same as we've had since 2013. It's uh, just a majority. And, you know, we're going to... Uh, I, I don't know if our, what our plan is on the most awful ones, and um, it, it's, hopefully everyone's attention will be on some of the other Cirrus, but they're going to try to get terrible people in, and they probably will. Thank you. Over so here. So sorry, this is why, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is why we're all so worried, yes. Yes, I have a, I have a health care question as well. Um, as you know, the, the, that 
The Senate has this committee. They're meeting. It's secret. Um, literally, Mitch McConnell. It's not a committee. It's just. Right. It's a group. It's a yeah, group. It's yes. a group. It's a group, yes. Group of and guys. Apparently, Mitch McConnell wants to um, roll out whatever they, they decide to do without even a committee process, let alone regular order. Do you, now I'm reasonably well read. I suspect everyone in this room is as well. Do you know anything about what those guys are doing that we don't know? Oh, okay. Um, right now, it's just about they're getting 50 for something. I don't think Mitch McConnell is steeped in health care policy. And I don't think he cares. I think he just wants to get 50 votes and get something out so they can fulfill the thing they've been saying for seven years, which is they're going to repeal and replace it. And so um, the, this is the question we're asking. There's not much leaking out. There's some stuff leaking out. But um, a lot of Republicans thought Hillary was going to win. And for the last, uh, since 2010, they have not really thought about health care other than to use it as an issue. And so I am shocked uh, that my, and I'm not saying that like the, uh, uh, Casablanca, I, I'm literally shocked that I have colleagues who don't know anything about health care. They don't know that if you allow insurance companies not to cover a certain set of essential health benefits, that you're getting completely getting rid of this of the protection for people with pre-existing conditions so i don't know what's going to come out of there because that's in the house bill the house bill allows states to have waivers on essential health benefits and they would be back to pre i mean this is they're going all the way back to before the aca this is um i'm hoping they can't get the 50 and that we end up having to do it in a bipartisan way we're going to take two more questions, starting with you. So thank you again for being here tonight. Um, as I'm sure you know, the verdict for the shooting of Philando Castile was announced today. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to know anything you could say. How do you fix a system where if I'm afraid of someone because of the color of their skin, I can kill them and get away with it? And I realize that's a difficult question. <laughs> well, you know, anybody who saw that video and, you know, on top of all the, I mean, we know that police have been, um, you know, killing black people um, because they're black people historically and that we now see, see it because we have cell phone cameras. I mean, we have, we've seen videos of the South Carolina thing where the guy was running and he places a taser near him. And I, I don't know what happened in this. This was a jury. This was a jury that was uh, mixed racially. Um, you know, what we saw and uh, I, I wasn't on the jury and I wasn't there, so I don't know. It's, it's obviously very disturbing, but um, I, I want to hear more about the case and what, what the rationale was. I know that I, I believe his girlfriend said that he told the officer he had a gun <laughs> and then was going to reach for his... Uh, registration, that's when the policeman shot him. And, uh, but I, I would have to know more about the trial, but there's no question that this is um, incredibly disturbing and is um, that there are communities in the country that have every right to be uh, just very angry about the whole history of this, so. Thank you for not pivoting. <laughs> For what? Not what? I didn't hear it. What did, what did he say? Oh, for not pivoting. I got it. That's funny. Okay. Right. <laughs> Last question over here. 
Hi, Senator Frank, and thank you so much for coming to Seattle. Um, my name is Rick Hegdahl, and I am the National Field Director for VoteVets.org. We're the you. largest progressive veterans PAC in the United States, representing half a million veterans, family members, and other supporters. And uh, you came to Kuwait in the USO tour back in 2005, and I was there, and I had to miss it because I was on watch. So this is my thank you, my personal thank you for coming over there and taking care of the troops and entertaining them so well. Um, a, a bit of information about um, Medicaid that you may or may not be uh, familiar with, but nearly 1.7 million veterans in the United States rely on Medicaid in some form or another, either to supplement their VA care or Medicare or what, what have you, which also includes 17 million veterans. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I just, I, I have something I can hand to you later. You know, I, I, I want to sure. thank you mainly for all the uh, health care support you've given and all the support you've given for veterans, including the service dogs for veterans. That was an awesome thing for you to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just say this. Should we take, let me, so thank, since you, that thank you to Vote Vets, and thank you for, you know, the USO shows were the best thing I ever did. Since that uh, wasn't a question, we'll give you the last question here. All right. Who's your favorite SNL character right now? <laughs> what I want? Who's your favorite SNL character right now? Oh, I, I, the, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> okay, all right. Then I thought they had a great year. I thought they had a great year. And that's beyond, beyond uh, the political stuff. I thought they just had a really good season. I think the cast really gelled, and I think the writer, I think there was a balance between the writing, I thought the writing this year uh, was good. I mean, the show always, in, in the best years we had, the show would be spotty. Um, it was just how spotty was how good the year was. Uh, this year, uh, I thought they had a good balance between the writing and the performing, and uh, that's when the str uh, show is always at its best, so it was a good, good... Senator Franken, I was counting on this question rising up from out of the audience. Since it didn't, I'm going to take a liberty and ask this question to close this out with. A lot of people told me to ask you this question. You can hear the concern in the room about the direction of this country. You obviously have the chops as a communicator, as a television personality. Don't go and, there. And, and you have the policy chops. Would you consider running for president? Well, you know, I think the person who, I think you want someone as president who just really badly, I mean, wants to, to do that and uh, just has that fire in the belly. And I've seen the presidency up closer as a senator, and I just, I just think it's, um, uh, it's not a job that I really, really, really want. And I just don't, I think that you should really want that job. I think that'd be like a good thing. <laughs> uh, for the president, so, and I'm not, it's very flattering, it's very, thank you, it was very flattering uh, to hear that sp little splatter of applause, <laughs> and, um, uh, but, uh, you know, we'll find somebody who's great, you know, who's going to be really, really uh, strong, and uh, that'll come through the process, I think, I hope. And, uh, you know, I just, you know, I, I, I'm too tired already. <laughs> I don't vice think... president? Could I bargain you down to vice president? Well, it'd be weird to, I mean, you know, that's a little easier. <laughs> you know. I, I, only if the person who asked me is really young and healthy. <laughs> Senator Al Franken, thank you so much. Okay.